ID 0110780, subject, modern architecture, Johnson, recorded 27th the 6th, 80. Sydney architect Harry Seidler was appointed visiting professor in architecture at the University of New South Wales for the first semester of 1980. He was born in Vienna in 1923. After studies in England, he graduated from the University of Manitoba in Canada. Later, he did postgraduate work at Harvard University under the founder of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, and studied design under the painter, Josef Albers. In 1948, Seidler started to practice in Sydney, and the many buildings he has completed since then have earned him an international reputation. Amongst his best known buildings are Sydney's Blues Point Tower, Australia Square and the MLC Centre, and Canberra's trade group offices. A recent overseas work is the Australian Embassy in Paris. This final lecture is a summary synthesising the essentials of Seidler's experience in the realm of both aesthetic and technical issues, which he groups together as principles in the mainstream of modern architecture. The purpose of this last one in the series of six talks on modern architecture is to sum up, is to bring into unison the diverse characteristics that have manifested themselves and can be summed up to be the principles of modern architecture. Now before doing that, it may be appropriate and in fact very timely to say something about a new tendency, which in the media throughout the world uh, that deal with architectural matters has been referred to as the postmodern idiom. Now one would think when reading this uh, uh, theme and uh, seeing buildings illustrated under that heading, that we have progressed beyond the sphere of modern architecture and what it purports to stand for. Now, what really is it? Those who suggest that modern architecture has served its purpose and it is time to depart from it will have us believe that we should revert at this time to some kind of historicizing, reminiscent of the mode of the end of the 19th century where eclecticism was the mode of the time and that is to simply borrow stylistic themes from past eras and simply apply them to our buildings. Now, the fact that this appears to be almost proceeding unchallenged, people just look at it, they are quite intrigued with it, but to really analyze it from a reasonable point of view, to say that uh, it, we should now remove from the record and reverse the entire course of the theoretical structure of rational response to environmental needs as they have been developed in the last half century and more is no doubt a sign that contemporary architecture must be in, the state of, in a state of crisis. Now there is no doubt that there is a certain disenchantment and dissatisfaction on the part of the public, the user public, and the profession itself about what modern architecture has performed. Now the reasons for this are complex and they certainly vary with the cultural climate from place to place. The discontent I feel is greater in America and to some extent in Australia where uh, newer cultures have come to life than in countries of continental Europe where generally not only better recent architecture has been built, but envir total environments have come into being. Uh, countries such as Scandinavia, Finland, uh, Denmark, uh, and also West Germany. In other words, in places where modern architecture has become far more an absorbed and an integral part of local cultural patterns. In other words, the disenchantment really comes from places that have accepted almost superficially what the movement was all about. What it had to say was a very strong message. And this message really didn't reach 
for instance, places like Australia, till well after World War II. And even then, it was little more than a faint echo of what had been heard two decades before in Europe. Now, the rejection seems to be greatest where only the rational aspects of modern architecture were embraced, the logic of structure and constructional devices, without an equally compelling aesthetic or sociological base. Now, this is particularly true in the United States and here. Now, it's interesting that postmodern, so-called, seems to be an entirely United States phenomenon, although its influence is starting to spread. It's known about in continental Europe, but it seems to generate no more than a journalistic shrug of the shoulder. They simply don't take it or write about it seriously. Now, what really is it all about? I think we have in front of us something that is very influential on architectural performance, and that is commercial pressures. Commercial pressures are with us in free enterprise countries, and to stand out at almost any price is equated to survival, just as in the world of fashion. What's new? Who is new? Ask the students who are hungry for new designer heroes. What is staggeringly new? Ask the salesmen, advertising agencies. And these matters no doubt rub off on architects, and particularly architects that don't have the backbone of conviction of a methodology of approach, a solid base from which to build consequential action. Now, I have no illustrations to show about uh, postmodern architecture, but basically what uh, the protagonists show us, and uh, very few such things have ever been built, are, as they refer to, metaphors. Metaphors, parallels, uh, exposing some kind of element of the past uh, in order to supposedly make us feel closer to history. They say that this is really what people want, uh, and uh, it, it, it is far more um, in, in, in line with what the consumer public expects architecture to do for them. To me, this sounds painfully like what happened in uh, the early 1950s in uh, communist countries, where also modern architecture was scorned upon uh, and uh, not liked by the powers that be, and uh, the edict was to ape some kind of historic uh, style. Now, to suggest to us that we should ignore and defy all constructional, let alone structural logic, uh, and looking at the buildings that result from it, I feel uh, uh, they really are the tantrums of a rich, spoiled child which is simply delighting in being contrary, shocking us with rather, uh, one must really say, corny stylistic idioms, uh, not to uh, say bad taste. Now, it could all be ignored if there were not the danger uh, due to all the wordy journalism which surrounds this uh, tendency from being taken literally and seriously by the young and uninitiated and blown up and, in fact, catapulted into the significance of a new design philosophy. Now, after the days of revolution of modern architecture, I think it has matured enough to encompass a respect for history and historical continuity. But this will not mean copybook copying of stylistic idioms. It will extract the viable essentials of any period of the past, re-examine and remold these responsibly in present-day terms. Now, what is needed, I feel, at this time is to reiterate just what are the viable characteristics, the elements that make modern architecture flow along a quite discernible path as it develops in different parts of the world. Now, first of all, modern architecture delights in exploring the unexploited great visual riches that the other arts have contained and which are relevant and applicable. One of the problems is, of course, that the visual phenomena, almost axioms as they have been uh, termed, have never been clearly stated for fear of expounding new dogmas about design, of which there had been too much 
at the end of the last century. So we've never had it quite clearly stated, and I believe that needs to be done, the relationship between the different visual arts. Now the second major element will be modern architects, con modern architects' concern to push forward frontiers of technological development. Now this development has been immense in the last half century. Modern architecture will respond to the social and economic changes uh, that have been quite considerable in our time. Now it will also respond to the environmental upheavals inherent in the new conurbations, these enormous growth of cities that seems to be taking place in almost everywhere in the civilized world. Now to bring these into, co into a cohesive unity is the task of modern architecture, to solve diverse problems, to create unity with the awareness of the need to create diversity for differing people. The starting point, I feel, to state some of these criteria is that famous school in Germany uh, that was founded in 1919 by Walter Gropius and called the Bauhaus, the School of Building. It, its thesis, in simple terms, was the new, revived fusion of the arts. Technology, painting, sculpture, architecture, and the new social needs of society. This goes back to the time after the First World War. They need to be brought into a happy marriage, not where one succeeds at the expense of the other, but where they, these uh, diverse um, tendencies move hand in hand and interact desirably. Now, this is a tall order. And to simplify uh, and state in um, uh, almost a summing up term of what the visual world was all about at that time, and to quite an extent is still the case today, all we need to do is to look at a Cubist painting such as this one by Picasso, which goes back to the early part of this century. Now, what Picasso draws is a portrait of a person, a side view of a person, and even the rear view of the person superimposed on each other, which implies that there is a concern on the part of painters to deal with the element of time. There is a need to, for time to elapse before we can see an object in three different, from three different angles. To superimpose them develops the uh, the tendency of transparency, of lightening the conventional solidity and to introduce the element of space into paintings. Rather than solidity, there is now space. And no one could better sum this up, this concern about the spatial attributes of the world, the visual world of the 20th century than Joseph Albers, one of the teachers at the Bauhaus, who makes us see space in an intriguing new way. Here, he draws a geometric, very concise uh, structural constellation, as he refers to them, but he makes our eyes go through uh, virtual acrobatics to make uh, tangible reality out of this quite enticing composition. Space and dissolution of conventional solidity are the characteristics. If, as Maholi Nagy, one of the also one of the teachers at the Bauhaus said, we symbolize traditional painting, traditional sculpture, and traditional architecture by the solid cube on the left. The tendency of the 20th century eye is to wish to explode the components of this cube, and we see its component surfaces frozen, as it were, in space and generating between them a flow of uh, air, of movement, of a new concern about that which is not solid, but generates the movement of the eye between uh, these confining uh, surfaces of space. The Dutch group of painters referred to as the De Stiel 
uh, painters of the early 1920s, here represented by the well-known painter Theo van Doesburg. Um, they uh, portrayed this very tendency in uh, quite a clear way to show these surfaces, the planes, the space flowing between them, uh, and, and, uh, and the surface is virtually arrested in space, as it were, hovering in, uh, uh, in uh, air. And although the American architect Frank Lloyd Wright uh, always disclaimed any uh, influence by uh, modern painters, or Europeans of any kind, for that matter, uh, there is no doubt that his famous house, Falling Water, built in 1936 near uh, Pittsburgh in the United States um, has this very same visual impact on us. Planes hovering in space in an entirely new way. They appear to have none of the conventional ways of uh, heaviness, masonry, uh, weight reaching the ground. There is some dissolution uh, uh, some tendency to dissolve things has taken the place of uh, the conventional solidity. Breuer, in, his, in the museum of built, he built uh, in the, uh, the Whitney Museum in, the United, in, in New York, uh, uh, did a beautiful background exhibition to uh, the, the sculptor Calder's uh, works. And the need was to have white surfaces against which Calder's sculpture uh, would be seen in, uh, in, in silhouette, such as this case here. But the interesting thing is how that plane, uh, which uh, is standing on the ground vertically, is juxtaposed with one that is uh, apparently, visual, uh, from a stability point of view, quite impossible to, to place above it. But there it is. It opposes this one, uh, and it um, defies gravity, virtually. Now, when we look at the world of the sculptors, we find a very parallel tendency. Henry Moore, in his uh, sculpture of recent times, in the uh, 60s, I think this was uh, actually uh, uh, shown in, in, in Florence, a great exhibition of his work, uh, uh, introduces a new element into sculpture, entirely new, uh, because this really was never the concern of sculpture in the past, and that is to Gave, give great emphasis to that which is not there, the hollow within, the form of the air that is contained within the sculpture. Traditional sculpture always concerned itself about the solid matter, the solid body of the, of the sculptural form surrounded by air, whereas now the tendency is to mold within the solidity a new form, which is of equal if not greater importance. And this hollowing is, in the sculptor's term, a similar tendency. Now, let us look, first of all, at the early architecture, how it responded to these painters' and sculptors' tendencies. And we find Le Corbusier in the house at Garsh, which was built for uh, the family of um, Gertrude Stein outside Paris in 1927. Uh, he produced a building that is, in fact, dissolved, almost like Moore's sculpture. It is hollow here. We can see sunlight coming into, the, into its center, uh, virtually here. And uh, this, of course, is made possible by new means. But visually, it is important to recognize that architecture, sculpture, and painting have these common tendencies. In another house, which is now a national monument at Poissy, outside Paris, uh, Corbusier built this house for the Savoy family. And again, we look at the, uh, the, 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 the circumscribing uh, uh, simple uh, silhouette of the building, but find that it is, in fact, hollow. We look right through the opening here and find an internal courtyard uh, that is open to the sky. So here again, we have this dissolved, hollow sculpture uh, that is so uh, typical. When we go to the inside, we find this freedom of the dissolved, of the exploded planes of conventional solidity uh, imbuing the interiors with an entirely different mode 
a mode that allows us to penetrate vertically and horizontally in buildings as never before. We see a ramp rising through openings. We see spiral stair going up uh, vertically. Uh, and this is, uh, these are all interiors of his early houses of the late 20s. At the Villa La Roche in Paris itself, uh, a new tenancy, uh, this new way of uh, dealing with space uh, and dissolving the conventional solidity is very clearly uh, evident in the way f space flows in, in, in all directions. It is no longer the uh, uh, confined uh, volume of the past. Now, there is another painter that needs to be mentioned in connection with what has happened in modern architecture, and that is Mondrian. Mondrian, uh, of course, was a most influential painter in that uh, he not only uh, had something to say uh, to the language of architects, but uh, without him, our modern typography, uh, um, design of a, almost any kind, uh, would be quite unthinkable. Well, what he shows us uh, is the fact that there are other ways of making things balance rather than the phlegmatic, traditional, symmetrical way of uh, having equated elements on either side of an axis. He says, well, if I take this small blue uh, rectangle, its weight will counterbalance and uh, oppose this uh, larger yellow square and produce a dynamic kind of balance. And this dynamic balance is really something that has been taken over by architects very wholeheartedly. Here's Gropius, his own house in the United States built in 1930. And we see uh, not only the composition that would give uh, some uh, evidence of an influence of this kind in the way the elements are arranged and oppose each other, but also the transparency that is obvious. There's light coming into the solid uh, 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 circumscribing outline. Uh, and here we have the same house with sculptural elements pulled out from it, and again a similar uh, tendency of having openings right through the facade itself. Now these tendencies came to Australia rather late. Here's a house of 1948, which again I think can be recognized to speak this language. It, uh, its window divisions are almost Mondrian patterns. It is raised off the ground, uh, almost like uh, the Villa of Le Corbusier's at, uh, at Poissy. Uh, therefore, dissolving the conventional solidity of a, uh, of, a, uh, of a building. And on the interior, it does make space flow far more than it was ever allowed to do uh, in the past and in traditional architecture, which dealt with solid volumes rather than the fluidity of um, uh, the new visual tendency. And also the needs. The needs uh, of buildings, uh, be they houses or any other kind of in interiors, even uh, if the, the designer's aim is visually to create space, uh, there is a need to uh, be more flexible, to allow things to merge and be used for different purposes uh, at different times. And this excludes, really, the, the constriction of traditional architecture. And here, in this section, we show uh, clearly how uh, space not only can move horizontally, but it can, in fact, move vertically and from one level into another. Uh, down here, up there, through here, and up again, and so on. Uh, the whole thing becomes a flowing um, uh, totality, adjusting itself, as in this case, to a steep hillside, which now can put things at different uh, levels and arrange them uh, where most opportune. Uh, to combat the physical needs. On the interior, the loosening up of the different floor levels will allow space to flow. We will always have a view of something beyond the eye rather being, than being confined by the uh, surfaces of a volume will be allowed to wander uh, and uh, be intrigued with what is beyond. We can look down, but we can't quite see it. We can look up to another level, we can't quite see what is there. Probably there would be no better and superb example of this flow, not only within 
uh, vertically, horizontally, but to the outside than this house by Marcel Breuer, built in the south of uh, Switzerland, uh, in, uh, near, near Lago Maggiore, uh, the Kurfer House, uh, a, a great symphony of, uh, of spatial um, uh, uh, achievement, as much as is this uh, recent example from the United States, I am Pays, a new uh, wing of the National Gallery, uh, a triangular-shaped building with um, uh, a, a positive symphony of, uh, of spaces flowing literally in every direction the eye uh, wanders to. Now, what else are the principles? If we accept the visual world of the painters, what other elements are there uh, that architects uh, could be influenced and have been influenced by. And if one had to sum it up as a principle, it is the geometric systems that have come into life, that have been pinpointed by artists, those sensitive translators of the impacts of our time, to be of concern to our eyes. The system. Frank Stella, a painter in the early 1970s, painted this uh, picture in his uh, uh, series called the um, uh, uh, protractor uh, elements, playing with quadrants and semicircles. And architects, because they are concerned about systems, about making things easy to build in accordance with a system that allows repetition of identical elements, pick up these very same system-orientated designs. And here, in uh, a cultural center in uh, Ringwood, two quadrants, uh, a theater and a function center, are shown to repeat a theme that is started and permeates the whole design. The building picks up a theme and carries it through. Just as in music, there's counterpoint in architecture, there is geometric theme underlying very often uh, uh, the basis of a design. And here, as one moves around it, you see uh, these curves and counter curves uh, evident uh, from different uh, views. You see one curve placed and juxtaposed against another on the inside, as well as uh, the uh, exterior. You see a bulging of uh, convex and concave surfaces here, uh, convex, concave, and so on, all repeated, of course, in the seating as well. Now, the other great influence, aside from the visual ones in, uh, on modern architecture, which is irrevocably imprinted as a basic principle of pursuit, is the advancement of technology. Here, we have an early bridge, and to our eyes, it's not as remarkable as all that uh, today. But this was built in 1906 by Mayer, a famous Swiss engineer uh, one of the first to give expression to the laws of nature in the way he sh solved structural problems. And quite beautiful forms uh, result from this pursuit, uh, with no uh, visual aims particularly, but to solve problems of defying gravity in an imaginative and uh, constructible way. Here is an aer aeroplane hangar of 1936 built by uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi, the famous Italian uh, pioneer engineer, uh, and uh, it uh, spans quite unprecedentedly long uh, distances with this crate work of uh, elements uh, that are prefabricated. The, the expediency of how to make things comes into it. The uh, components are assembled on minimal scaffolding and are fused. Uh, together in, uh, in place to result in the spider work of, uh, 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 of a large building. Uh, in the uh, uh, early 1970s, he built this Burgo pa paper mill, which is a, a single building more than a thousand feet long, some three or four hundred meters long, uh, a suspension building, almost built like a bridge for reasons uh, to avoid having um, uh, supports, columns within the building. There was a need to have wide open floor space of such enormous dimensions. Now this again can be said to hark back to the uh, exploits of our sculptors uh, of the day. Alexander Calder 
he, he, he opposes the very two themes that have been mentioned. One is the solidity of the, of the past almost, something that's very stable and stands like a tripod on the ground. And uh, the very opposite, visually, the moving, suspended, uh, uh, web-like, spidery, uh, mobile, uh, mounted on top of it. The expression of uh, showing what really happens in nature to uh, uh, mold buildings in response to the organic needs of structures, I think is uh, most brilliantly portrayed by Nervi in, in, his, in his many projects. And here, uh, an exhibition building that consists of a no number of mushroom-like structures. We're looking up at one of them uh, with the cantilevers, with the projecting outward elements which get thinner and smaller as they uh, reach the extremity is obviously logical. Uh, heavier here uh, than it needs to be there, and that's expressed. And in the column, uh, which uh, has to resist bending at the base uh, most drastically, but quite differently, and therefore it changes its shape uh, to giving a circular support to this big umbrella structure above. Not dictated by visual uh, uh, playfulness at all. It is directly responding to the laws of nature, as is the case in this high building, uh, Australia Square, where uh, Nervi, as a consultant, suggested that the columns should change in shape from bottom to top as is only logical in a building of that height in order to uh, uh, express the fact that there's less load on top than there is uh, in the legs at the bottom of such a building. Uh, the fact that the, the external columns, the legs of this large uh, tree-like structure need to be tied back to the core is expressed in this very rigid uh, interlocking system of ribs on the ceiling. Could be done in many ways, but Nervi chooses to do it in a beautiful organically patterned way, almost as the underside of a leaf structure. Uh, again, a tall building, the MLC Center, expressing the laws of nature by turning only eight columns outward to give greater stability, not for aesthetic reasons, for reasons of structural uh, integrity and validity of the, of, the, of, of, of the building. And how is it achieved? Uh, in the 21st century, we will not have armies of laborers who are able to, uh, who are willing uh, to uh, uh, perform tasks on top of scaffold. We will have less and less uh, people on the site. We will have more and more in the factory. And here we see a component of such a building made in the factory being hoisted to be erected on the site, uh, on uh, the building itself. And here, uh, a structure that is virtually all made under controlled factory-like conditions, whether they be on the site or in, in fact, a, a, a yard. Uh, a building made out of three components, a long facade beam, a, a cross beam, and a column to hold them up. So you make those three elements and have sufficient uh, uh, mechanical equipment to put them into place and that will, with those three elements, put together a building uh, almost like a mechano set in very, very uh, quick uh, time. Uh, enormous new potential is inherent in the pursuit, in the, uh, the advancement of technology when applied to building. Uh, the open spaces that new structural devices can give us respond to the needs for greater flexibility and multi-use of our buildings. And this wide open floor space is obviously a universally applicable uh, thing to our changing needs and demands that we place on buildings. Uh, to integrate the needs of structure with that of mechanical services is also one of the principles and concerns of modern architecture. And here we see the structure expressed, exposed, responding to the laws of nature, changing section, beam, uh, offset against an element that uh, is uh, a mechanical one. Uh, the tube carrying the air-conditioned air, above it, the lighting. In this fashion, where the structure, in fact, becomes the light diffuser for the rest. Here's the, the air, the light, 
and the structure becomes a reflector and will illuminate the uh, interior. Now to go to another deep concern about modern architecture, and that is in the th sphere of the total environment. It is, as has been found, hollow victory indeed to end up with a superb piece of architecture if it is in fact placed in the middle of environmental chaos. It will be of not great advantage to the community. Now I only show a few instances of the concerns of modern architecture and what can be done about them. Now this is a very sad picture in that uh, this is the lack of planning, the lack of concern about the environment, allowing things to happen, just simply letting the, the, the fickle demands of the marketplace uh, determine what shall get built, such as pull down a house and build in its stead a block of flats containing 30 more people than lived in this, and yet make no other provision to help the, uh, the totality when it is finished. The result is, of course, we get narrow gaps between buildings, and this is what people are now more and more can uh, condemned to, to live in. Uh, very unhealthy, uh, not only visually, but uh, aesthetically, and I think socially undesirable. What could be done is uh, a greater demand for site amalgamation, where changes of a drastic nature are to take place, such as uh, increasing a density of population suddenly by uh, tenfold or so. Uh, and here, instead of allowing every existing 50-foot block which existed uh, carrying houses on them uh, to build each block of flats facing each other. Uh, roads have been closed. We don't need so many roads. The area of the roads given over to swimming pools, tennis courts, and the buildings turned at right angles so as to have the traffic on one side and the private outlook on the other side. Now this makes common sense um, and surely is of advantage rather than, uh, and here we have the privacy that is gained of outlook, of open space that can be gained by this kind of planning first step and the outlook from a balcony of a, uh, a three-story building or whatever it may be onto the newly gained uh, public space. Now this is one of the deep concerns about architecture, not to stop at the building but to be uh, uh, most concerned about the totality that a group of buildings result in. And in the city, the pressure is probably the greatest because here uh, the tenancy, the marketplace has built 12 times the site area, 12-story buildings cover their, covering their whole sites and look at the end result. We get confusion, we get congestion, uh, which is hardly desirable uh, uh, from the point of view of the city and life in it. And one of the answers is go up higher. If you must build so much floor space, is it better to dispose of it in a tower form and leave plazas, open space uh, available to the public. Newly gained public space on private land. And these are the kind of secluded plaza spaces that are attractive and that are an asset to the city that are the very concerns of, about, of modern architecture. And not that there's anything new about these concerns because people have always wanted throughout history have wanted to uh, relax in uh, city squares, uh, even eat outdoors, watch the passing parade, and that has been the concern of cities throughout the ages. Here's a, a picture of uh, Siena, a medieval uh, city of, uh, with its main square uh, of just that same uh, activity taking place, people sitting under umbrellas and enjoying their midday meal. Now to sum up what I thought I would like to do is to show one example of a building that, in my view, has responded to all these principles and uh, the principles that I feel to be uh, uh, very much an integral part of modern architecture's concerns. And that is a building placed in the magnificent city of Paris. Paris is quite awe-inspiring in what it has done uh, throughout its uh, uh, history in the way of creating an urban pattern that is utterly outstanding and, uh, and magnificent. And is largely based on uh, the um, axes that have come into existence by uh, the great potentate 
Napoleon III and the designer uh, Haussmann, the great uh, urban designer, uh, who planned these great axes. Here's the Louvre, uh, Place de la Concorde, uh, and the Avenue uh, Champs-Élysées up to Etoile, the uh, uh, Arc de Triomphe. And here's the Palais de Chaillot, uh, a curved building placed on the axis of the Champ de Mar, uh, going right through the Eiffel Tower. It is located here. And the problem was to build in this quite magnificent setting of Paris, very close to the axis of the Champ de Mar. And I think the concern of, of modern architecture to come to terms with the locale of where it is placed, not simply to w work in isolation, but to absorb something of the place and find an appropriate pattern which should be exploited in a particular instance. And here the demand obviously was to accept and respond to this great axis of the Champ de Mar next door. And one has to only appreciate the, 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 the enormity of this axis to, uh, to say how uh, reasonable it is for that demand to be made uh, heard. And the answer came uh, indicated or suggested by the Palais de Chaillot. It's two part elliptic buildings sprung on either side of the great axis. And the building, the Australian Embassy uh, in, uh, in Paris, recalled this same theme of having two quadrant-shaped uh, buildings facing and generated by the axis. Here's one axis, here's its right angle to it. Uh, the office building uh, curves one way, the apartment building curves the other way, and they respond to this, the axis going through and at right angles to the Eiffel Tower. And they do so for the reason to gain the maximum advantage uh, of how to arrange the internal elements. Uh, the office building um, uh, places all the offices on a curved facade outward so as to gain the maximum of the view. And the apartment building, which is the second part of the uh, building, places all the living rooms on the, uh, on the side facing uh, the view and getting the maximum of benefit to the occupants and what the building is, after all, all about. And here's a view of the model of these two opposing, uh, oppositional, uh, uh, geometrically uh, synchronized elements, two quadrants uh, of the, the model. And not, again, that there is anything new about the, the enticement of uh, opposites. Uh, the convex and concave uh, concern was one uh, that made itself manifest uh, first, I think, in the Baroque uh, period. Here's a building by Borromini of the mid-17th century, which was well aware of, these, uh, uh, of, of the juxtaposition of negative and positive to be of great uh, visual benefit to a design. The, the chateau at Chantilly near, near Paris, uh, built in the 17th century also, uh, a magnificent counterplay of curves, both positive and negative. Modern sculptors. Norman Carberg, uh, an American student of Joseph Albers, uh, uh, his sculptures portray a similar concern of the opposites moving in direct uh, uh, confrontation to each other, the opposing uh, curves uh, of his uh, uh, sculptural element. And the painter we have already seen probably comes closest almost to the form of, the, of this particular building itself two quadrants in juxtaposition in a concave and convex uh, arrangement. Now let us, let us look now at the end result and we see the building uh, as seen from the Eiffel Tower and consisting of these two uh, curves, the apartment building, uh, convex, uh, I'm sorry, concave, the um, uh, office building, uh, the chancellery, uh, with its outward uh, bending uh, exposure uh, toward the view of all the, uh, the offices. When looking the other way, uh, well, the Eiffel Tower is uh, barely out of sight here, uh, but we can see the, uh, uh, the office building as it curves toward the view and uh, the apartment building behind it. Now, one would think there is a uh, great problem about uh, building a curved building. You know, one would think that uh, it is very tedious and uh, labor-consuming 
uh, and difficult to, in fact, achieve. Now, by the system of technology, a system of geometry that was adopted, this is not necessarily so. Because if we take just the office building itself, here we have a floor made of elements that are precast, that are made on the factory conditions. And instead of being just parallel beams, they are slightly tapered. They're a little wider here than they are there. And if we put enough of those together, we automatically get a curved building. The advantage being that it will be much quicker to put together by having uh, not only the floors, as I've shown, but also the external walls made in the factory. These elements are uh, simply lifted up by the crane and put into place, like a mechanical said, and these beams, of which we've seen some before in the uh, I showed of the trade offices in Canberra, uh, spanning a long distance, giving us uh, quite column-free space on the interior, changing their section as dictated by concerns of uh, statics and um, uh, structural uh, matters, uh, we get an assembly of uh, units uh, made possible by the lifting technology which is, has come into uh, being in, uh, in our time to end up in vast, open, flexible floor space which is so orientated as to make this bent, curved wall here uh, face the most magnificent view available. Now, the synthesis of uh, this building uh, is one that has to bring into unison quite different elements. Now, we don't only build uh, facade elements. We also have to get into the building, drive into the building in this case. And uh, uh, this meant interrupting the system. And there is an appropriate case for interruption if in, in, in fact, the interruption can also be expressive of what really happens. And here, Nervi again, uh, his hand is, 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 is quite evident. Uh, he, he brings into unison the curve from above, a curved, repetitious facade from above, is picked up by this element. And as nature's forces dictate almost, it is, uh, these are brought down from that curved surface by means of hyperboloid surfaces made of straight lines into these two uh, supports that give the whole structure its wind resistance. The result is that we gain this great gap in the building which allows cars to drive in and appropriately as wanted uh, to be able to uh, get out and get into the get out of the car and get into the building under cover and at the same time it is not only an expressive but a beautiful uh, sculptural element marking the entrance to the building. And here's a detail of how this was physically achieved. Because of the system of geometry, it is possible to make such complex forms out of straight lines of board uh, forms. They're simply straight boards, tapered, uh, put together, that give this uh, quite twisting uh, uh, element. Now, when we look uh, on the inside uh, of the building, and here we have a ground floor that shows this driveway in and out again and one enters here. It contains the core, of course, which is conventionally built, where the lifts and stairs uh, go up. An exhibition hall uh, where screens uh, can be arranged to show an exhibition across a bridge under the apartment building, which is above this, uh, to a theater, uh, Australian uh, information service, multi-purpose halls, and so on. So there's a fluidity of the spaces that the public has access to right at ground level. To look at some of these, here's the exhibition hall that has, uh, in this case, uh, uh, photographs of Australia, uh, beautiful large uh, uh, display objects of Ayers Rock and all uh, other things of Australia uh, hanging from screens uh, from this exposed uh, structure, those large beams that we had seen. And here we see uh, other scenes of Australia, which is obviously appropriate to have in such a building. Sheep, uh, uh, life savers on the beach, etc. Now, the 
uh, other spaces, uh, internal spaces of uh, um, uh, meeting rooms, exploit not only uh, uh, the element of industrial design, which is a great concern of architecture, not to only stop at the bare shell of a building, but to develop um, excellence in the elements of lighting, in the elements of chairs, tables, internal finishings, um, as in this theatre, an expressive structure is there, unadorned, uh, a ribbed, coffered ceiling, uh, the air conditioning integrated with it, uh, and the chairs and lighting uh, a, a, a totality. The ambassador's office, uh, um, where every piece right down to the ashtray is made to have the same uh, symphonic coherence uh, visually uh, as uh, any other part of the building. Now, going outside again, uh, uh, after the, uh, the view side, uh, or the, the, the occupied uh, side of the, the chancellery, we see here it's concave rear, which is a blank wall only perforated by the needs, again, of technology of taking air in and pushing air out. But it is clad uh, uh, non-expressively because there was no structure to particularly uh, uh, make a point of. It is covered here in stone. Whereas where it changes to becoming the apartment building, the entrance to the apartment building, again, the loads from above made of, or, uh, superimposed on this large beam by prefabricated elements that come and sit above each other, that form the facade to the bedroom uh, windows in this case, uh, the opposing curve is evident, that this building bulges outward, the other one which we see in conjunction with it uh, curves uh, inward. And the supports to this are again uh, structurally expressive by picking up a curved beam and bringing it down to a circular caisson uh, foundation. How to shape an apartment building in, in such a way as to allow every living room to face only one way. The desired outlook is, of course, quite a problem. And it is achieved here by means of split-level planning, by having uh, all the living rooms on this side, but the approaches are such that uh, we come from a, a gallery, for instance, here, and we go uh, up to the living room, down to the bedroom, the gallery here, up to bedrooms, up to living room. Uh, a gallery there, up to living room, up to bedrooms. In such a way that all, all bedrooms are on the off side, all living rooms are on the on side, on the view side. And this uh, is evidenced by all the living room balconies, all the kitchen windows are in fact facing the desirable outlook toward the Eiffel Tower. And the way this is uh, possibly portrayed even more amply is um, by this uh, uh, sectional drawing uh, that shows the point of approach, uh, which is um, uh, over here, a gallery, you enter the apartment, you walk up half a flight, and you're in the living room. Or next door, you walk down half a flight, and you're also in the living room. But within the living room, or within the apartment, you then walk another half flight up to the bedrooms, which have their windows on the opposite side. And this being systematized and regularized is a simple thing to achieve. Here we see one of these living rooms where, in fact, you've just arrived up the stair. Uh, and it combines living and dining rooms. Here's another view of the same from living uh, to the dining end. And here's a kitchen, which should, as architecture in its early days advocated, place lighting above the task area, that is to have continuous lighting over the, uh, over the work areas, rather than in the center of the room. Uh, which would make a person always stand in his own shadow when performing a task. But back to some of these apartments that are uh, on so-called a split level that here quite evidently uh, gain from being um, uh, on the concave side of the building facing outward uh, to the 
uh, to the view at night. You can see also the spatial interplay, the far more interesting spaces that occur as you walk down or up from a bedroom or an entrance into a living area. It will give a far greater feeling of spaciousness, far more dissolution, far more uh, sense of the beyond to the individual uh, apartment. And the sense of the beyond and transparency, almost as we have seen in sculpture and in painting uh, take place, we see happening right in the center of this living room where you look right through the two-way fireplace and other openings through it to reveal fractions of other elements beyond. But the, uh, the, 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 the reason for it all, obviously, is to gain the maximum of desirable outlook for every occupant. Now, to uh, the, the Résistance is probably the ambassador's apartment on the top floor of the chancellery. And here we have a plan of it uh, on this very deep floor uh, to uh, provide for a salon and dining room and other internal garden court, external garden court, and other rooms. And how this was uh, uh, arranged and ended up uh, is seen in these pictures, the salon, which exposes the structure on the ceiling quite clearly without any uh, embarrassment or need to cover it up because the structure expressively, as it is developed, uh, can stay on its own. Uh, the artworks pinpointed by, or uh, emphasized dramatically by, wall wash lighting, lighting that would pick out that particular wall, almost uh, as was done in Baroque times, to always uh, centralize on a theme. Turning the other way in this large gathering salon, we see a pivoted door, a, or several, uh, a door that allows a greater number of people to enter the room by being a, a huge pivoted slab, as is uh, the one and uh, on uh, leading into the uh, dining room and uh, is the external garden court that allows daylight uh, to actually come to the interior which we can see here right in the middle of the open space we see the internal court full of plants and the pivoted door opening toward the uh, uh, the dining uh, uh, area and the dining area is of course where the great entertainment takes place and every element from uh, the knife, the fork, the chair, the table, the kind of lighting, the kind of plants, and the lighting arranged in such a way so as to not exclude the view outward at night, not to make mirrors out of windows, are devices that technology have taught us how to do. Uh, and uh, uh, it, all these components of industrial design and technology are an integral part of the concerns of modern architecture. Well, here we can see, of course, that uh, our diplomats uh, are, are rather well uh, taken care of. But this is a, an example of where one really tries to extract the most of what um, architecture uh, and, and uh, technology has to offer to serve a particular need. Now, to sum up, uh, I would say that the principles of modern architecture move in different ways in different parts of the world, but they are discernible. They are criteria that are applicable to the architecture of different parts of the world. They are criteria that are enforced by being fused with the concerns of painters, sculptors, technicians, engineers, and I feel the uh, synthesis of them all will continue to build upon and make better that which we've always called and probably will remain to be called modern architecture of the 20th century.